one of the things I wanted to start with is know thy audience. I think there's a lot of misunderstandings maybe about what Americans actually think about climate change. So I thought we'd start by taking a quick look at what, what we know from polling and other kinds of studies. Now, I don't know if you all have heard of Jay Faison. He's in our state, he's in Charlotte. He's a very wealthy businessman and he's a conservative Republican who's very concerned about climate change. Just last week, his group came up with this very interesting polling and he used the most conservative pollsters, people who generally work for Republicans to do this research. So I think what he says is if you ask them if they want to accelerate the development of clean energy, you see that Republicans want clean energy and conservative Republicans want it almost as much as the others. So this is just important information about who the audience is, what they think, what they care about, and what words trigger things for them. And if you saw my TED talk, I talk a lot about this whole issue of what words trigger things in people's minds. And when they hear words like regulate, restrict, cut, conserve, and tax, it shuts them down. It just goes against their ideology. But if they hear different words, and especially if they hear in a more meaningful way, what does this mean for our state economically? For example, solar, where North Carolina is one of the leaders in the country right now in solar. What does that mean for our state? So I also think that in reporting about climate change, it's important to focus not only on the threat, but also on the opportunity. And this goes back to what I was saying about you know, the solution side, where there's a lot of agreement. The whole story really is both, that there is this threat, but there's also a great opportunity to do something about it, and that it's, there's some urgency to this, right? So that brings me around to a resource that I wanted to offer you. It's the National Climate Assessment. So this is such a highly vetted report. And it's a tremendous resource because it goes region by region around the country to talk about impacts. It goes sector by sector through the economy. And you know there are a few high level messages that come out of this national climate assessment. The first one is that it's happening now. We're experiencing the impacts now in our own lives. The second really big overarching theme of the assessment is that impacts are happening everywhere. This is not just for someone else somewhere else. This is for us and all of us in our lives. And then the third message is that there's a lot we can do about it, both in the adaptation arena, the you know, preparing for and becoming more resilient to the impacts that we can avoid, and in reducing emissions so that we can reduce future climate change. One of the reasons it'll be helpful to you is that in addition to lots of detailed information, it also has some really good, clear graphics. Here's one that's very relevant. And what it shows is the observed change in very heavy precipitation. That's the amount of rain falling in the heaviest 1% of rain events and the percentage increase of those over the previous 50 years. And you can see some pretty big increases in heavy precip. We understand why it's related to the warming atmosphere and it has impacts as we've just seen. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about future projections because I think sometimes people get the wrong idea. When we talk about the range of possible futures, I think people sometimes think it's a matter of luck, that it's a crapshoot, that you know, if we're lucky, we'll get that, and if we're not lucky, we'll get that, but that's not it at all. The decision is ours. It's lower emissions gives us a few more degrees, higher emissions gives us more like 10 more degrees. So it depends totally on our emissions. It's the most important uncertainty in looking at the future. The choice is ours, the future's in our hands. And I think it's really important that we recognize that. And then, of course, we've had this experience that we've just had, and I wanna end on this. this. This to me brings up the question though of, how do you talk about this? How do you as a reporter ask scientists to, to talk about this in a way that's most appropriate. Sometimes my scientist colleagues will express frustration to me that they feel like the reporter is asking them a question that's not really the right question. They feel like they're being asked, did global warming cause this event? And they don't know how to answer that because it's not a yes or no answer. The answer is the way Tom described it yesterday, that it's increased the likelihood of an event like this and there was more water vapor in the atmosphere because the air was warmer and the ocean was warmer. So yes, it contributed to this event. It's part of this event. It's not the sole cause of this event. And so how we talk about that, it's partly on the scientists, but it's also partly on you guys, how you ask the question, how you craft it, how you frame it. But certainly it's playing a role. The atmosphere has changed. The environment in which all storms form has changed. So it's a different world now. And so every event is influenced in some way. And whether it's just because sea level is higher or just because there's more water vapor in the atmosphere or both, 
those are all questions. Okay. Thank you.